So we've established one landmark figure in Descartes and the suite of concerns that go with rationalism, concerned with reason and intellect, um, and a host of problems that go with that. We haven't spoken yet to the other side, which is empiricism. As we said, rationalism and empiricism contrast. Empiricists focus on the encounter of the body with the world. And in this sense, they are very, very interested in how perception takes place, for example, how the senses work in picking up information about the world, um, and how we come to know things by observing and watching. The most important of these is probably David Hume, the boozy old Scotsman, great fun, reputed atheist in the 18th century. Um, but there are others, and in fact, we, one frequently speaks of the, the trio of what they call British empiricists, in fact, an Irishman, a Scotsman, and a, an Englishman, so good basis for a joke. John Locke is the Englishman here, Bishop Barclay, the Irishman, and David Hume, the Scotsman. Three very different characters with very different uh, uh, philosophies, but what, a, what they have in common is their emphasis on the, the way that we experience the world and come to know the world by experiencing it, on seeing and perceiving things in person. So even though they have very, very different approaches, there is this common concern that we can identify as empiricist. And the empiricist tends not to do what Descartes is. There's this leap off to a grand abstraction immediately, positing an unobservable self but to start with the body and its connections to the world. And this leads us immediately to an example we already saw when we discussed the many meanings of the word physical. Remember doubting Thomas placing his fingers in Christ's side. He wanted to see and feel um, the wound in order to know something. So that kind of proof is strongly empirical. And that's one sense in which we use the word physical. He wanted physical proof, that is empirical proof, by witnessing himself. So empiricists tend not to abstract away from the situation quite as much. And certainly, if we're taking an empirical start, starting point, we're going to look hard at the various ways in which the body interacts with and connects with the world, and not necessarily regard the brain as an entirely separate magical organ, as tends to happen in rationalist approaches. So these two different ways of beginning our inquiry, and we're going to keep the contrast throughout, they're going to keep recurring as we approach the various topics that we're going to cover, everything from perception through human development and language and so on. Just by way of example, given that the empiricist assumes that bodily encounter with the world is necessary to acquire knowledge, the empiricist is going to take a view of the baby as being particularly uninformed. That is, the baby, once it's born, is only just beginning to learn and in fact, John Locke went so far as to call the baby a blank slate upon which nature would then write. Now, the rationalists, by downplaying the importance of sensory engagement with the world, nonetheless want to tell stories about how we come to be such magic thinking, languaging beings. And so they take out a loan on biology and assume that a lot of what's required, possibly even some concepts, are sort of built in. So that the question of what's innate, what's the, your biological birthright, and what's acquired, what's learned through engagement with the world, becomes a lively issue on which rationalist and empiricist positions differ. This is often cast as the nature-nurture debate, and those two terms are both far too simplistic to serve us here. But sometimes, just as with empiricists and rationalists, it's useful to have extreme points uh, that can serve as landmarks as we explore the territory in between. Now, <coughs> the look, work we've looked at here was from the 17th century, from Descartes, 18th century, Hume. Um, we're working now in the 21st century, and we don't have time to cover all the developments that happen in between. We'll cover some of them. But one position which found great resonance in the second half of the 20th century is the idea that when we're talking about mind, we're talking about something that the brain specifically is doing. This is something that has emerged in public discourse and become part of our everyday talk, such that the brain becomes the big dustbin in which everything is swept. The 
the reality is far more complicated than that and our knowledge is far less certain than that. But the idea that one could understand questions one has about the mental, about knowing, perceiving and so on, as questions about what the brain is doing, this took hold of popular imagination starting in the 1960s, grew to be a very orthodox position by the 1980s in what was then the discipline of artificial intelligence. And it may be a view taken by many neuroscientists today, but by no means all, because we don't have a unified position on what the brain is and how the brain does, what the brain, how the brain is to be understood. I mentioned also the spectre of artificial intelligence and the kind of thinking that was done in the 1980s under the label artificial intelligence was concerned with such matters as how would we understand an equivalence between minds and brains. That term has changed its meaning over the last 30, 40 years hugely and it no longer means that. It's a very misleading term as we'll note several times throughout this course because the word intelligence comes from this rationalist interest in philosophy of mind. But the field of artificial intelligence today has nothing to do with that. It has to do, and it hides behind that. We'll get into that later on in the course. Contemporary artificial intelligence is of little relevance to cognitive science. So having introduced these polar positions, I suppose, the required reading for this week um, gives you two articles and they come from different places. One is an update of a rationalist position which is couched in modern terms. It's from a guy called Marvin Minsky who died a few years ago and was very important in the field of what used to be artificial intelligence. Um, and it expresses the most popular view probably today, although the variety is such that I'm not sure one can pick out. One could say that quite with that strength. He's going to argue in favor of what's known as the computational theory of mind. And the computational theory of mind is a theory we'll come back to again and again. It's assumed by some people, it's rejected by others, but we'll need, as we explore this course, to find out what it is and what it might be able to tell us and what it might not be able to tell us. So Marvin Minsky here is going to be a contemporary rationalist kind of thinker. And the other side will be provided by Louise Barrett with the article with the wonderful title Why Brains Are Not Computers, Why Behaviorism Is Not Satanism, and Why Dolphins Are Not Aquatic Apes. And starting off with Why Brains Are Not Computers, you can see this is not going to be a computational theory of mind. <laughs> and it presents a very, very different and equally respectable position in contemporary cognitive science. In fact, much of um, the arguments in favor of, of that, that pick out an empiricist position are going to recur in a contemporary context uh, as we revolve around the notion of embodiment or what it is to be embodied. So the Louise Barrett article could be seen as uh, embodied cognitive science, which is a contemporary and empiricist approach. Minsky's is a computational article which fits in with it's a contemporary uptape on rationalism. So it's important to have these two and to weigh up for yourselves and see which arguments sound plausible, um, which things you might be willing to go along with. And don't be too quick to make up your mind about this. We're going to face many puzzles in this, in this module and it might be good to keep an open mind as we explore the various positions. <laughs>